A big shout out goes to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Check them out at ground.news forward slash droid. The link is in the description below. From around the mid 1960s, a new type of aircraft led the way in introducing multi role fighters and bombers, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union and then Europe. This hybrid style of aircraft looked to combine the low speed flexibility and efficient crews of a straight wing and the high speed capability of a swept wing and supersonic performance aircraft in one platform. The first of these to reach full production would be the F 111 Aardvark, and although it had a problematic berth, it would go on to be one of the USAF's most dependable aircraft for almost 30 years. From the 1960s up until 1981, aircraft made with swing wing designs were made by the US, Soviet, and European manufacturers and used on some of the most cutting edge designs of that era, like the F 14 Tomcat the B-1B bomber, the Panavia Tornado, the MiG-23, Sukhoi Su-24, Tupolev T-160, and some others. But there was a sudden change, and then from 1981 onwards, no new swing-wing aircraft have been built anywhere in the world. So why did swing-wing aircraft become so important in the 1960s and 70s, and then fall out of favour from the 1980s onwards? And why did only military aircraft use this technology and not commercial ones? To understand why variable geometry or swing wing aircraft became important for military, you have to go back to mid 1935 when the German aeronautical research scientist Adolf Bussmann was working on transonic and supersonic airflows and how they affected things like wings and propeller blades. All production wings at the time were straight and perpendicular to the fuselage with lift and stability as their main goals. Aircraft speeds were still low by today's standards and supersonic performance was just a distant goal. But in the mid 1930s with the advent of the jet engine, that goal began to move much closer to a practical reality. Though few people at the time knew that the existing straight wing technology would not be suitable for transonic and supersonic flight. Adolf Boosman discovered if a wing was swept back, it would delay the onset of wave drag, a form of aerodynamic drag that increases dramatically as the wing travels at the speed of sound and led to the concept of the sound barrier. This would be later reinforced by early tests where aircraft would lose control because of the severe vibrations of the wave drag created on both the wings, fuselage and control surfaces. In 1935, Boosman presented a paper at the 5th Volta Conference in Rome about supersonic lift. And although several important future dynamicists were at the conference, his work was thought to be more of an academic curiosity, because at the time, aircraft speeds of over 300 miles an hour were a rarity. At the time, all propeller driven fighter aircraft and bombers had straight wings, primarily designed to give lift and stability and even in high speed dives didn't go fast enough to be affected by wave drag. But one Spitfire Mark 11 did reach Mach 0.89, 620 miles an hour or 1000 kilometers an hour in a high speed trial in 1943 during a 45 degree dive before the propeller was ripped off due to the reduction gear failure. The pilot survived and managed to glide the Spitfire back to base, but this was very much a fluke occurrence. As jet engine technology was independently developed in both Britain and Germany in the late 30s and early 40s, the aerodynamics of both the fuselage and wings became increasingly important, which brought Boosman's work, which by 1936 was classified by the Luftwaffe to the fore. Up until 1942, Boosman conducted a large amount of wind tunnel testing on the shape of wings and how they responded at supersonic speeds, which would be put into use by the Luftwaffe with experimental aircraft like the jet-powered Messerschmitt Me P1101, the rocket-powered Messerschmitt Me163 Comet, and the jet-powered Me262. After the war, Britain was also experimenting with potentially supersonic aircraft like the 1946 de Havilland DH-108 and the Miles M52. In 1947, Chuck Yeager in the rocket-powered Bell X-1 which was very similar to the Mars M52, broke the sound barrier, 
although ironically it used straight wings. But it was the fact that they were very thin and more like fins rather than wings and combined with the all-moving tailplane that they got it to work. Now while Boosman and others studied aerodynamics, at least they knew where their studies were leading to. But in today's 24-7 news-driven world, it's difficult to know what the real truth is and who's spinning it for the benefit of their own agenda. And this is where ground news can help you see through the clutter and noise of all the competing stories. Ground News is an app and website developed by former NASA engineer Harleen Kaur that shows you everything in one place so you can come to your own conclusions about the news. But it also shows you who the sources are, what their political leaning is, and who owns them. To give you an example, here's a news story about NATO giving more air defense systems to Ukraine. On the right, you can see the coverage details, the number of sources, and how recent the updates are. Then the political biases of those sources, left, center, or right-leaning. Here they are mostly left-biased. Below is the factuality score, which is quite high at about 64%, and who owns the source? Here they are mostly media conglomerates, but then equally split between government and corporations, as these are ones most likely affected by this. Just click on any of the sources to see the article. Or you can look to the left of a page and skim the headlines of the articles to see how each source is framing the news and then go to the articles from there. You can also search for the subject of articles you're looking for, be that on current news events, people or politics, basically any type of topic. Or check out the blind spot feed for stories that have little or no coverage from one side of the political spectrum and build them into your own following feed or just browse the news for what interests you in particular. To find out more and access data-driven information from around the world, go to ground.news forward slash droid. The link is in the description below. And if you subscribe through my link, you can get 40% off the Vantage plan for unlimited access. In 1945, just as the war concluded, Operation Lusty, which was short for Luftwaffe Secret Technology, was set up by the United States Air Force to try and capture and evaluate German aeronautical technology during and after World War II. This was split into two teams. It was here that the second team came across Boosman and his work at the Braunschweig Labs on the 7th of May 1945 and the huge amount of data he had created. Some of the team had actually been to the conference in Rome where he presented his paper in 1935, although they couldn't quite remember the main points that it was about. On realising the importance of the data, one of the team, George Scherer, immediately wrote to Boeing and told them to investigate the concept which led to the remodelling of the B-47 Stratofortress with swept back wings instead of straight wings. In 1947, Adolf Boosman moved to the United States and started work at the NACA Langley Research Centre, where he worked alongside Robert T. Jones, another pioneering aerodynamicist to develop both swept wings, oblique wings, and delta wings. Also as part of Operation Lusty, a jet-powered Messerschmitt ME P1101 was discovered at the Messerschmitt's Bavarian Oberammergau complex. Along with the jet engine, the ME P1101, which was unfinished at the time, also featured a variable sweep wing, although this could only be changed on the ground and not during flight. It was brought back to America and studied in detail by Bell Aircraft, which recreated and flew their own version. And this became the basis of the 1951 Bell X-5, the first aircraft to be able to change the sweep of its wings during flight with three preset settings of 20 degrees, 40 degrees and 60 degrees of sweep. Even though the idea worked, the X-5 had a flawed aerodynamic layout, in particular the poorly positioned tail and vertical stabiliser, which in some wing positions could lead to an irrecoverable spin. This led to plans by the USAF to modify the design into a low-cost tactical fighter for NATO to be cancelled. But it wasn't just the Germans that had been interested in supersonic flight. The jet engine had been patented in England by Frank Whittle in 1930 and first flown in Germany in 1934, bringing supersonic flight to the mind of one of Britain's greatest wartime inventors, Barnes Wallace, who had created the bouncing bomb and the massive earthquake bombs Tallboy and Grand Slam. 
the largest non-nuclear bombs dropped of World War II. After the war, he started researching to creating a new type of aircraft with a fully operational swing wing at its heart. In the late 1940s, he designed the Vickers Wild Goose, an unmanned aerial vehicle, which he created to research a tailless variable sweep aircraft which would be controlled by moving the wings in flight and avoided the need for conventional control surfaces or a tail. This led to development of the Vickers Type 010 Swallow, a Mach 2.5 swing wing controlled aerodyne with no tail or control surfaces and which was a proposed replacement for the Vickers Valiant V4. Barnes Wallace's team would later go on to create the swing wing technology used by aircraft like the Panavia Tornado. And during the 1960s and into his retirement, he developed ideas for an all-speed aircraft, capable of efficient flight at all speed ranges from subsonic to hypersonic. Wallace's swing wing technology, which was shown to NASA in the Swallow designs, would later go on to influence, along with work from the Bell X-5, the 1964 F-111 Aardvark, the world's first swing wing aircraft to be put into production. This aircraft was also an attempt by the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, to create one aircraft that would be suitable for both the USAF and the Navy, and hopefully cut costs, but things didn't quite work out that way for the Navy. Seeing how well the F-111 combined the qualities of both low-speed flight, economy of cruising, and supersonic capabilities, the Soviets soon set about creating their own versions and ended up making far more than the US, producing 10,922 swing-wing aircraft to America's 1,379. The Soviets took a slightly different approach in creating two different systems which varied in the distance as a percentage of the total wingspan between the wing pivots. This could also be adapted to fit existing airframes without a complete redesign, such as the Sukhoi Su-17 in 1966. This will be supplemented by the more advanced design of the MiG-23 in 67, the Tupolev Tu-22M bomber of 69, and the Sukhoi Su-24 of 1970. In the US, after the failure of the Navy to get the F-111B to work for them, Grumman produced the F-14 Tomcat in 1970, which went on to be one of the finest aircraft not only of the 70s, but the 80s and up into the 90s. But it wasn't just fighter aircraft which benefited from variable geometry designs. Large bomber aircraft such as the 1974 B-1B Lancer, the prospective replacement for the B-52, and in 1981 Tupolev created their even larger Soviet version of the B-1 with the Tu-160. However, the Tupolev Tu-160 would prove to be the last aircraft to use swing wing technology. By the 1970s in the US, advances in wing design, new, more powerful and fuel efficient engines, and computer controlled or fly-by-wire flight regimes for aircraft with relaxed stability started with the 1974 General Dynamics F-16. This new type of aircraft was basically aerodynamically unstable and could not fly without the aid of a computer, but this made them far more agile and that eroded away what advantages the swing wing designs had back in the 60s. Advancements in materials, computer aided design, computer control of slats, flaps and spoilers meant that the new wing designs could do much of what the swing wing designs could do without most of the disadvantages. Swing wing designs were a product of their time, but they were also heavier, were more complex and cost more in maintenance and lost valuable space to the swing wing mechanisms, issues which the new designs had little to none of, and soon the emphasis would be on the ability to fly into a theatre of war without being seen by radar. This was exemplified by the new stealth technology of aircraft like the F-117 and the B-2 Spirit Bomber. No matter how well swing wing designs might have been tweaked, the one thing they were poor at was being stealthy. Stealth designs relied upon extremely complex fuselage and wing shapes to reflect as little radar energy as possible. A swing wing design, on the other hand, because of the constant changing of the wing profile, could never be made truly stealthy. Although the B-1 Lancer did a fairly good job considering its size, with a radar cross-section of 10 square meters. 
but that was nothing compared to its success of a B2, with a radar cross-section of 0.0001 square metres, about the same size as a bumblebee. So the simple answer to why swing wings stopped being made was that we found better ways of doing the same job without the mechanical complexity, and the requirement to be stealthy excluded a moving wing design. Although commercial aircraft have never used a variable geometry design, right back at the beginning of the race to create an American supersonic transport aircraft to rival Concorde, the original 1960 design of the Boeing SST did feature a swing wing. However, the titanium mechanism became too big and heavy at 2,100 kilograms, which reduced the range and also reduced the space in the cabin so it no longer made economic sense as a commercial aircraft, and they switched back to a delta wing design like the Concorde. But that was before it nearly sunk Boeing financially, and it was eventually cancelled, leaving the subsonic Boeing 747 to rebuild the company fortunes. Swing wings were never used in commercial aircraft because unlike military fighters and bombers, they only ever needed to do one job from the beginning and variable geometry design was just not needed. Swing wing manufacture may well have stopped in the 80s, but there are still many in service today, with two of the most prominent being the B-1B Lancer and the Tupolev Tu-160. And in a strange twist, in 2022, a new Tu-160M highly modernized version took to the air and production restarted with two planned for delivery in 2022, and 10 more on the order books. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, share, and subscribe, and a big thanks goes to all of our Patreons for their ongoing support.